Good evening and welcome to East African Voices. Now, over the past about 13 weeks or so, uh, three to four months, you have been watching a program which has been looking at the issues around the East African community. Laban Cliff on Serio has gone around the whole of East Africa, the five countries, looking at issues to do with taxation, issues to do with infrastructure to do with business, looking at where the East African community is placed and what we have to look forward to in terms of developing the community. This program is going to be a special one because whereas you've been watching us um, both in Kenya and Uganda on television through these shows and also on YouTube, now we're bringing you a live program both here and in Kampala looking at what it is to look forward to in the East African community. So for now, I will be crossing over to Kampala to join Charles and his team over there. Charles? Thank you very much, uh, Wallace. Um, Thank you very much, Serena, uh, uh, Conference Center. And uh, in Uganda, we are joined uh, by um, John, uh, John Walugembe from the Uganda Small Scale Industries Association. And I have uh, Everest Kayongo, Kayondo from Kampala City Traders Association. Then I have uh, John Sempebwa from Uganda Tourism Board. Now, uh, of course, we're looking at uh, doing business in East Africa under the East African Common Market Dispensation or Arrangement, if you like. Now, um, I'll move very fast to you, gentlemen, and, and I'll start with you, John, uh, John Sempebwa. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, uh, what has been your experience uh, doing business within the East African Common Market Arrangement from the you know, perspective of tourism? Uh, in the very recent past, we have seen some significant strides in cooperation mm -hmm. uh, as stipulated in the East African Common Market Protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, you, are, you know about the single visa? Mm. Well, uh, sorry, I'll cut you short, John. Yeah. I'll, um, we'll delve into that and a uh, couple of other issues uh, yeah. from tourism, from trade, and of course from manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, viewers, I'll hand over to uh, Wallace uh, in Nairobi. Uh, Wallace, over to you. Uh, you now have a feel of you know, the kind of uh, debate and people that we have down here in Kampala. Uh, debate over to you, Wallace, down here in Kampala. Over thank, to you, Wallace. Thank you very much, Charles. And, and you can see the sort of uh, questions and debates that are going on all over the East African community, representative obviously right now of just the two countries, Kenya and Uganda. And similar to what's going on in Kampala, we have quite a distinguished audience with us. I will not introduce all of them. They'll sort of get to know who they are by the sort of things that they'll say. And I'll start with you, Betty, because um, you come from the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and manufacturers have been a core part of trying to drive business in the community of East Africa. What sort of framework or environment are you seeing? Are things looking positive? Are things looking neutral, negative? I think we're getting used to uh, we're getting used to things. It is true uh, that uh, manufacturers have had um, I mean have had some of the largest opportunities for business in East Africa because the initial agreement, the East African Customs Union, focused mostly on movement <coughs> uh, and freedom of movement in trade in uh, trade in goods, and we've seen an increase in trade uh, in all our you know, in all our countries. And the statistics do show that uh, the the um, exports of goods by Kenya, by Uganda, by Tanzania to the different markets has increased over time to the point where Kenya, I mean, the, the East African community is actually about 25% uh, of Kenya's market. So in that sense, it has been a market. That's of manufactured goods? Of manu yeah, no, of goods, of all, of all exports. Okay. Uh -huh. Of all exports is in, is in East Africa. And increasingly, in the beginning, Kenya used to be the dominant player. But when you look at the statistics now, and the goods as well in the supermarkets, there is more presence of, uh, there is greater presence of goods from our partner states. So in that sense, the community has provided an opportunity for greater business for all of us, not just Kenya, but also Tanzania and Uganda. And now, I guess, Rwanda and Burundi having joined, with, and, and they're also not very heavy on manufacturing. But we also seen a lot of the Rwandese, uh, Rwandan products, juices, for instance, yes. to make, come into this market. So at least in that sense, it has provided uh, a, a better market. All right. A guy you come from, the shippers, which is the broad rubric of infrastructure. There has been some positive developments. Um, if you look at Kenya specifically, the roads at least have improved. We used to have a cattle truck running from the port of Mombasa into the interior. Now that's looking slightly better. We have a railway being built. Um, the central corridor through Tanzania is also looking uh, fairly positive in terms of how it's structured. 
But are we where we should be? Um, should we be optimistic uh, while we wait for things like the Standard Gauge Railway, or are we still slightly behind or even ahead of where we should be? I think it should be <coughs> very optimistic because, as you have said earlier, the railway development is in the right direction. Mm -hmm. The port expansion, both in Dar es Salaam and Mombasa, are also encouraging. And then the introduction of the weighing in motion has brought posi positive e effects on the way bridges. Weighing in motion is where the lorry comes and, and it's it doesn't have to stop. stop. It doesn't have to stop. <coughs> so these are good initiatives that will bring forth good, good uh, outcomes. Vimal, I, do, I don't know how to address you. Because uh, for those of you that don't know Vimal, he wears about 20 different hats. I'll just mention three of them. One is the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, which you chair. Um, you're obviously former chair of the Kenya Association of Manufacturer Betty's Institution. You're also a manufacturer in Bitco. You're also in the East African Business Council. So I'll ask you to choose a hat to wear. And you were asking before we went on here whether we are positive about East Africa or we are pessimistic about East Africa. I want you to answer your own question. What do you feel about the region and where we are and where we are going? And choose the hat which you want to answer that question. I think I'll just wear a hat of private sector, <coughs> and that's the private sector player in East Africa, you know, in, in four countries we're manufacturing. And I think overall, uh, very bullish on East Africa. In the longer run, um, really big potential market. Uh, the demographics prove it. The, the regional market proves it. The opening, um, opening up has happened. There's a lot of work in progress. There's a lot of things that need to be done that are still undone. And I think first and foremost starts from leadership, at the top, all five countries need to say clearly, we are one East Africa, no more of Kenya versus Uganda versus Tanzania, and we actually have that. Second need to thing, say, are they saying it though? When you say they need to say it, is the language starting no, to No, they're develop? saying it, they're saying it. All I'm saying is it needs to be proven in action now, whereby the people below, starting from the ministers, going down to the other people who actually implement these policies, free movement of goods, free movement of people. We just need to start making that happen. Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda have done a fantastic thing in terms of regional movement, and it's much more smoother. Tanzania and Burundi need to come on board, and we become really, truly East Africa. Carl, you're fully representative of the private sector, and obviously you've got lots of members who do all sorts of business um, in the region. What are your members telling you when it comes specifically to regional trade um, and how Kenya is able to trade with the other four East African community countries? I think I'll just echo a lot of <coughs> what has been said. There's a lot of good things that are happening, and you can hear it from different sectors, uh, despite the challenges. Of course, there's goods now that we're seeing from different, um, the different countries. Um, I know tourism will speak, but uh, one of the things to be pushing on, on tourism is just the whole issue of the airspace and, and all that. You've seen the telecommunication, and um, especially with uh, Rwanda now in Uganda and having uh, harmonizing their, their, their calling prices. And I think, but what has, has been coming out more and what we will continue to want to see is where the countries are working together, e echoing what Vimal is saying. And they've started. When you start hearing about a uh, coalition of the willing doing the infrastructure projects together, that's a positive thing. And I'll give a good example. When we were doing, the, when the EPA process began, EU, with all its 27 countries, knew exactly what they wanted, and they could agree this is where we are going. We struggled a bit at EAC level, even though we're just five countries. And I think it's important to keep moving that way. So we want to see the way we've gone through the, the telecommunication, we're starting to do infrastructure. We just want to see more of that. We are better, we win, to, we win much if we work together. The whole idea of what the business community wants to see, and the business community is very united on what they want to see, the things they want to see done. It's the same thing with the community. We want to see them working together as one. It's not about Kenya, it's not about Uganda, it's not about Rwanda. Even though some things, one country may look like they are, win they are getting more, the jobs that will be created, mm -hmm. the wealth that will be created is for East Africa. So it's, right. it's very important that we do, we want to see a lot of joint projects. Now, th there's a very lengthy conversation that we are going to have, like we told you, if you are with us from the beginning of the program, both here and in Kampala. We'll be coming back to this room momentarily to hear from the rest of the participants in terms of where they are and how business is going for them within the East African region. For now, we will take a break, coming right back on the East African Voices.
uh, Wallace. And um, once again, um, we are here at the Kampara Serena uh, Conference Center, and I'm joined by, you know, a number of uh, you know key business people in Uganda. And uh, of course, before we went for that uh, break, or handed over to Wallace in Nairobi, uh, I'd ask you, John, um, John Sempewa from the Uganda Tourism Board, uh, about your experience, uh, you know, within uh, the East African Common Market uh, yes. dispensation or the East African. Uh, integration process as we know it now. Yes. Mm. Uh, first, in the last two years or so, we have seen unprecedented cooperation in the form of first a single visa. Mm. Instead of paying $150 in three, four, five different places, a tourist coming into East Africa pays only one visa. What does that mean? It's a very big opportunity for tour operators in Kenya, in Rwanda, and 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 here Kampala to offer multi-country packages, mm. which means that the region as East Africa is moving towards a single tourist destination. Mm. So we have seen Rwandese tour operators selling a tour of River Nile, uh, selling uh, whitewater rafting level five again on the River Nile and bungee jumping, which they don't have. Mm -hmm. So the East African common market, I think, for the tourism sector is coming into fruition because it is based on, the, on Adam Smith's principles of specialization mm -hmm. and do what you can do, do best. best. Mm. Leave what you can't do where you don't have competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that Uganda has a huge advantage in, in, in tourism and we are working very closely with the partner states in joint promotion mm -hmm. we're coming up with a joint like sort of brand and branding mm -hmm. uh we benchmark against each other we do joint trainings uganda visited tanzania in quality assurance uh we do joint training of of uh, quality assessors we uh for example use the same standards mm -hmm. In, in hotel classification. So as far as tourism is concerned, we are happy with the level of cooperation. We seem to be pushing in the same direction. We seem to be pushing for the same goal. Very good. Uh, Everest, I'll bring you in here. You represent a group of, uh, 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 you know, a, a very critical area in this market. I mean, that those are the traders, Kampala city traders. Um, how are you looking at this uh, 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 process uh, or, or, or step that East Africa has taken under the you know, the ESC arrangement? Well, it is 50-50 uh, a, a uh, because we have had some challenges and we have had some advantages. Mm. Uh, some challenges, uh, some advantages about expanded uh, market and uh, some of our traders have uh, enjoyed the ESC now. They can freely move to Rwanda, to Burundi, Tanzania and uh, Kenya. Uh, but again, uh, we have had a number of challenges, especially where we have non-tariff barriers. And uh, these non-tariff barriers have been impacting on the flow of business, especially between Mombasa and Kampala, uh, like uh, cash bonds. Uh, uh, then uh, we also had some challenges of uh, cargo tracking systems. and. Uh, Single customs territory also has had some challenges. Mm -hmm. It has advantages of expediting uh, clearance of our merchandise. Mm. And it, fa it has reduced the number of days uh, where we have the goods from 15 to about now five average mm -hmm. to six days. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, these unilateral declarations by our brothers from Kenya have also had a an impact on their trade. And I think uh, if some of these matters are addressed, addressed yes. especially where our exports, uh, some of our members have tried to export to Kenya, mm. and uh, then Kenya has been hesitant to receive our goods, saying now if, if you have a deficit of production locally in Uganda, why should we export? And mm. we are thinking of just looking at the whole of ESC as one market, I don't wait to first satisfy the, the, the local market before I do the export because mm. uh, I, I can export anywhere I have found the market as long as it is giving me a competitive advantage. 
Now these are the challenges. Number two, the, prepare, uh, the level of preparedness mm. of our business community. To that, yes. Uh, we'll get back to that, uh, yes. Everest. I'll bring in uh, John here, um, John Walgembe from you know, the Small Scale Industries Association. Of course, productivity is very key uh, because it's one of the things we take to this regional market. Yeah. And uh, in this economy, I mean, everyone is looking at SMEs uh, where, of course, your association sits to drive that particular docket and how have your members fared under the ESC? What has been your experience going forward? Well, as we know, the bulk of uh, businesses in this country and in the region are small and medium enterprises. And uh, of course, as we know, we all desire as a region to increase the share of locally produced manufactured products that are being sold internally. Mm. So how the common market has been able to affect us is twofold. One, it has been advantageous because it has put to our disposal a market of about 140 million people. Mm. So that means that those enterprises that are competitive, those enterprises that adopt best practices are able to take advantage of this market. On the other hand, those enterprises that are not able to up, up their game to learn from their counterparts will be challenged and have been challenged mm. in this new dispensation. Mm -hmm. The other advantage of the common market is the aspect of skills. As you know, we've been talking about the skills deficit. And small businesses need skilled technicians, artisans, and so on. So the beauty with the common market is that you can easily get the required skill um, that you need in your enterprise. Mm. So on the whole, I can say it has been advantageous. Mm. But for some businesses, challenge. It's a challenge as well. Uh, some people, I'll, I'll get back to you again. Of course, you mentioned some of the advantages, the dividends that uh, this initiative presents. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there were number that it promised. You know, uh, the crafters of, for instance, the East African Common Market Protocol promised us a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And yes, like you say, some have come to pass. But mm -hmm. are our business people, are the people in the tourism industry, for instance, in Uganda, in your view, ready to take advantage of the opportunities that are presented uh, by this uh, 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 opportunity? First, <coughs> what are these advantages? Uh, John has just mentioned mm. the first opportunity is to source qualified skill. Yeah. I can, with 100% confidence, assure you that the tourism sector in this country is tapping into qualified labor from Kenya. Mm. Go to any hotel, you will find qualified and experienced personnel from Kenya comfortably running hotels in this country. Mm. But what does this mean? Uh, it has triggered a national effort to improve the school which is in charge of building the caliber of, of persons in the industry. That's a plus. Mm -hmm. So you can say we were found uh, deficient, but integration has showed us that gap and a step has been taken by HTTI mm -hmm. in Ginger to, um, to correct that, uh, uh, that gap. But let's go to the basic the number of visitors, the number of tourists coming into Uganda from Kenya and Rwanda mm. is surprising. Mm. The increment from 2010-2014 is probably twice the increment from 2005 to 2010. The perception all over East Africa that you're now free to move has, I think, helped the tourism industry most. Mm. In for, for, for Uganda, in two ways, we have tourists that come to study, students. Mm. Uganda has an advantage in education. Students will always come here to benefit from our affordable and high quality education. Mm. They're tourists. We welcome them. Uh, the fact that the common market has borders open 24 hours, mm. you have Rwandese Revelers. Thank you very much, John, uh, for that submission. I mean, um, we'll take a very short commercial break here, yeah. uh, dear viewers. And um, of course, uh, it's um, a message of, of optimism from uh, Kampala Wallace. And uh, of course, there are a couple of issues, um, you know, also on the challenge side, which I think we'll be able to tackle. And of course, the solutions going forward. Over to you, Wallace, and viewers will be coming back in a short time after that.
And welcome back to East African Voices. Now, you've been hearing how the situation is in Kenya and in Uganda as well. And I think it's a good place to take it up from where Charles left off with the tourism picture. Agatha, something surprising came out, and, and I heard it here as well with uh, some of the participants, that in the last holiday season, there was a lot of tourism intra-East African tourism. Kenyans hopping over to Uganda, Rwan Rwandans coming to the other countries, etc. Is that something that is just from one season, or is it something that's actually been building up? It's something that's been building up. We, in tourism, we have, we have seen growth in numbers of leisure tourists and business tourists from the region. Uh, and for us, it's been very exciting, and especially from the single tourist visa from the coalition of, of the willing Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda, we have seen growth in numbers because people now do not need a passport to travel. Mm -hmm. When you tell someone that you need to go and apply for a passport to travel, it sort of kills the whole vibe. But we were in, um, in Rwanda for a meeting, and they said when this was announced, within a month or two, they had 5,000 traders cross between Rwanda and Uganda through the Gatuna border. And there were traders going to sell chicken and bananas. So there has been growth. And that's, you, you're going to visit a different country to do business. That's also tourism. Even in Kenya, we have seen growth in tourist numbers from Rwanda, from Uganda, from Burundi, and Tanzania. We've had, for a long time, a good relationship with them tourism-wise. Forget the, the noise around um, movement of vehicles. I want to, I don't know what to call it, Charles, whether it's a reality check, whether it's um, knowing who we are as East Africans. The corruption question, because there has been, it's been a complaint across all of East Africa, um, historically and into the present, about what it's like to do business, what it's like sometimes to even get official services. But the bigger question is when it comes to the new wealth that we're going to be having very soon, the hydrocarbon wealth, oil, gas, and all these things that have been found um, beneath our soils. Do you have an impression of a bit of fear that because of the amounts of money that are going to be present in these economies, corruption could grow, or have governments put in place mechanisms to actually ensure that it doesn't become a big problem? Well, first of all, I, I need to say that uh, the corruption challenge is a real one in East Africa. It is persistent in the, um, uh, what we call grant corruption, but also in service delivery. There are uh, good stories also that one can mention, and I think the the, the transport corridors uh, uh, through the transport corridor through Kenya is a is a case in point that has gone quite a bit of uh, changes that are quite positive. We did a study in 2011, and the story was quite gloomy. We would want to do a repeat of the same and see how far we've come, but it's quite clear that some progress has been made. When it comes to uh, the issues of the natural wealth and the management of that, I think there, is, there are still questions and there are still fears that we have not done the things that need to be done to manage this wealth properly. Uh, the laws are being put in yes. place, um, uh, but, but that, there is that fear. And, and of course, in a, at a regional perspective, the, uh, the governance question is one that has not been high on the agenda of the East African community, uh, so to speak. And you will see that in the national government, look at the audit reports that are done every year in all the f uh, five East African countries. And also look at uh, even the secretariat itself. There are challenges to do with governance and accountability that need to be addressed. Yet the protocols or the initiatives that have been put in place uh, have stalled somewhere. And have so in, in effect, we, we sort of know where the problems are. It's just that we're not doing everything we should do to solve that. And, and one of the people I want to bring in is you, Ashif, <clears throat> because one of the problems, obviously, with uh, corruption and all these things that people are talking about, in fact, everyone who has spoken before sometimes comes down to this tax problem. And the tax problem, to me, is representative of a different framework. So when we were doing uh, the East African Voices series, the other 12 shows, one of the things that you were saying is we need to figure out how to harmonize tax. But some of the things people are saying, for instance, is that some countries should raise taxes, which is politically difficult. Some countries should lower taxes, again, which is politically difficult. How do you resolve? You're a tax person, so these sort of difficult jobs come to you. I think the, the, there has been some progress in the tax rationalization, but I think we need to rationalize our tax policies you know, very critically and look at the differences and try and resolve these differences. We cannot be talking of an East African region where we don't even have a double tax agreement in place. So I think the, the fast tracking of the double tax agreement is very important. The second thing is looking at... So, sorry, Ashif, 
some of these terms, double tax agreement, if I don't know anything about tax, what does that mean? That means that a double tax agreement is an agreement that gives you relief of tax. If you mm -hmm. pay tax in one country, you get a relief in the other country. So Vima, who trades in four countries or five countries, pays tax in Kenya, doesn't have to pay tax in Uganda for the same thing? Yes. Okay. okay. So, you know, that's very critical. But the second, you know, two critical parts is, you know, our fiscal policies and our monetary policies are very different. So if you look at Kenya's tax collections as a percentage of its GDP, it's really 25%. Uh, Uganda, Tanzania, it's below 20%. So we have a challenge there in terms of, you know, how do you rationalize your collection? Because some of these countries need more tax money than, you know, Kenya, which has reached a level of, you know, 25% is a very high global standard. Mm. So I think these are things that, you know, need to be looked at. How the revenue authorities cooperate with each other is another problem. Uh, you know, transfer pricing, when you do business cross-border, you have to, you know, equalize the prices. The issue is that if one country cannot agree with the taxpayer how to equalize their price, the two revenue authorities need to sit with each other and agree a formula that is fair to both. Because some of the people who have had the complaints is Betty's your members and Carrie your members as well, who do all this trading across the borders. And they say, you know what, we've been trying to do business in East Africa, we're providing jobs, providing goods and services, but it looks like the governments are slightly behind where we should be. Is that a realistic uh, or a fair thing to say? Now, there is always a distance and a great distance between the declarations and agreements we reach in Arusha and actual uh, translation to administrative and other facilitatory uh, practices at the border, post to within, uh, within, within, within countries. So some of the things that lead to situation of bribery and, and corruption is often just uh, blockages. Uh, if, for instance, you've agreed that we must, we can move our goods by recognizing each other's uh, standards marks. Uh, for instance, if uh, one country doesn't, then there's a temptation to try and bribe the officials at the border so you can get your goods in. Um, if, they, if we've ag if agreed on a certain axle load for trucks, then if you haven't done it, com complied, then you think, well, maybe we can bribe officials. So a lot of times, the, the bribery experienced in the context of trade is really petty. It's meant to facilitate quicker movement uh, across borders, a uh, resolution of you know, queries around documentation and such and, 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 and such. And that's, uh, that unfortunately is prevalent mm -hmm. around, uh, around East Africa, but there are some countries which are guiltier than others, including especially, I mean, especially when well, I think speaking for my own country, I think there's been a lot of uh, experience by traders on petty corruption with facilitatory facilitation and uh, trade facilitators, mm -hmm. which is problematic. And I think we need to, that's one of the things that we need to resolve by auto, oh no, uh, automating uh, systems and making it a lot easier uh, to trade and move goods across borders. Because I'll tell you, some of my experience, and, and, and I want yeah. to jump to you, Carol, but some of my experience when you talk about petty yeah, yeah. sort of official domain and, and yeah. officiousness, is here in Kenya, um, I've seen it for myself in Nairobi, where a vehicle with foreign mm. number plates, and by foreign I don't mean mm. the UK or whatever, Tanzanian number plates, Uganda number plates, mm. Rwanda number plates, Burundian, um, on also into the region, those are the ones that are always getting stopped by policemen. They don't seem to have any mechanical fault, they haven't driven badly, but the policeman is very quick to put their hand up and stop it. Now, when it comes to your membership, Carol, how, what do they tell you about that difference between the declarations made by the heads of state and other policy makers and what they're actually experiencing in the ground, whether it's about movement of people or whatever it is? I think the, last, the biggest challenge is implementation. So that um, the policy makers who make the declaration, everything will be put in paper, but sometimes it does not translate to that implementation, to the lowest, to that policeman who is supposed to understand that this is already a policy declaration at the highest level. And so they'll use other acts which sometimes are local and are not regional to, to try and implement what, what, what they're seeing in their field. So uh, part of it is a communication issue. Some of it is um, that, as what, what Betty is saying about petty bribery, because then I can get away with it, mm -hmm. you know. And um, by the time this information gets to the highest level, it's too late, it's too far off. I'm far removed from the highest level, so I can do it. So part of that, I think we need to communicate better the declarations made. 
Then also, we also find that the other challenge we find is that uh, declarations in terms of implementation seem to take different time mm -hmm. with different uh, sectors, but also different countries. So a declaration will be made by Council of Ministers of EAC, but you find either Kenya or maybe Rwanda or Uganda or Tanzania, name the country, may go ahead and implement sooner, and other countries behind. So you find the challenge when the, maybe it's movement of goods or people moving from that country to another. So the country that has not implemented that, people find the challenges, find the bottlenecks. Vima, mm -hmm. without asking you to speak on behalf of Carol, is what she's describing the fact that we should not be too excited by what declarations are made at summit level? Because it seems like they don't translate, even when the laws are done. But if the policeman who's standing on Mombasa Road is still able to stop um, Agayo's lorries from going, delay them by two hours or whatever it is, does that mean that the excitement should stop being at the summit level and start getting, trying to be excited about the stuff that happens closer to the ground? Not at all. I think, I think the issue here is one of implementation. And this comes back from officials. We have got institutions in East Africa. We have the East African Customs Act. We have got a director general there. We've got the whole customs which can be centralized in Arusha. <coughs> We've got a whole court system there, the legal system, which is an East African community. It's not been tested because we haven't empowered it. I think our own ministers haven't empowered East African community to start working and getting things done. So I think this sort of a thing would be going to East African court to say, fine, this country did this or that. And that's important, number one. Number two, the guys who are deliberately misunderstanding, they know if I had as a foreigner here, there won't be questioned, there won't be any, any, any noise made. So they can actually do that and most people from outside will feel, okay, I'm a foreigner. But having open borders now, having had ID cards going across, this should cease. And in fact, there should be mass uh, you know, uh, dissemination of information to say, this is your rights, this is not your rights. That might sound very nice, Agatha, but the experience that East Africans would have, let's say it's um, December, right, or the Easter break, and I want to drive across to Arusha which is perhaps the closest city there is to Nairobi. But if I get to the border, I'll be told where's the logbook for your vehicle, where is this original documentation and that original documentation. So I'll choose to stay in Kenya. Now, the tourism may happen if I, I'm on a public bus or I'm on a plane, but if I can't simply drive across a border because of all this official dome, it goes back to what everyone is saying. No, that's very true. There's still, in as much as we say there's free movement of people, facilitation for the people to move across is still a challenge. It's, it's something that's being worked on. You need to get your commercial license. You need to hand in your logbook. And for most people, it's too much of a hassle. But things are getting easier. It is easier now than it was five years ago. And it's also an issue of awareness. You may want to go to Uganda or to Rwanda, but you don't know what to do there. Mm -hmm. And we also realize that in Kenya, our operators don't know what to sell in the other countries and neither do the operators in the other countries know what to sell here L late last year we sent some operators to uganda for the jaguza international festival and most of them had never been to uganda they've been around the world selling kenya but they've ne we, we've not traveled to our neighborhood so we don't even know what to do there so there's a really really huge awareness issue which is something that our governments and ourselves as private sector need to focus on Betty, you wanted to jump in for about 30 seconds before you go on break. Yeah, I, I think the point, the, 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 the point is um, not to lose faith with what is declared or agreed in Arusha, because I think that sets the framework of the intention. But at the same time, we need to translate that, and people need to be more curious, because it will not just come to you. Mm -hmm. You can't just wake up and leave home to go to Arusha without trying to figure out what are the, what, what, what are the requirements for crossing the border. So when you get there and you're told, leave your logbook, you can't say I, th this East Africa doesn't work just because you didn't you know, educate yourself. So we also need to educate ourselves. But having said that, Wallace, I think our leaders and ourselves, we also need to sometimes <coughs> go slow on, and on the decisions and the declarations that we make because you cannot overburden a population. There are many agreements uh, in Arusha that we have made that when we track, we have done very little about. We don't have capacity to implement, to domesticate, and you just keep moving very fast on the integration journey. And if those things cannot, do not get translated into local laws and into local practices, people will start to give up and just, uh, give up and just think, ah, this is just a conspiracy of bureaucrats. We need to have it, we need to have an integration pace that is consistent with the expectations and the reality 
of people as well. Yeah. All right, um, interesting conversation going on. Uh, we are on East African Voices, just uh, looking at what issues are in East Africa, hearing from, I don't call them horses, but the horse's mouth, the people who actually do business in the region. We're going to a break right now, coming back to have more of a conversation about East Africa and East Africa's Voices. And welcome back to East African Voices. Very interesting conversation going on both in Nairobi and Kampala about issues of the East African community and exactly where we are and where we are headed. And for now, we want to cross over and hear a bit more of what's going on in Kampala with regard to the East African community. Over to you, Charles. You older, you I think when you grow older, you become wiser. Thank you very much, Wallace. Um, Again, I'll come back to you, Everest Kayondo, uh, from Kampala City Traders Association. Before we went for the break, I, um, well, I was looking at, of course, the dividends that we've seen coming through from, uh, you know, the East African Common Market and the entire integration process. Uh, but uh, I want you to just break it down for us. I mean, are our people, are the traders, for instance, that you represent uh, in Kampala ready to take advantage of this development? Yes, yes and no, because uh, we have uh, a group which is actually completely unaware of what is taking place. Mm. And we have others who are in the know, but uh, they don't know actually how to get started. Mm. Then we have those who are suffering from inertia, mm. where he is confident of what he is already aware of, mm. and he doesn't want to risk into any... Uh, 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 I, I, where he is not very familiar, with. familiar about uh, mm -hmm. the risks uh, of venturing into going to the ESC, going to Kenya, how you can maybe take advantage of the ESC uh, protocol. Mm -hmm. But we again have another group who are actually ready, mm -hmm. and those are the people who have tried to export and have had <laughs> some challenges mm -hmm. because of uh, some ad, uh, policies which have not been. Uh, addressed at the ESC level. I can give you an example. One of our exporters who wanted to export cosmetics to Tanzania had a challenge of uh, definition. Uh, cosmetics drugs or they are just uh, mm. like a, a, any other commodity. Mm. And here they are classified as any other commodity and uh, it's UNBS mm. which uh, regulates the standards. But in Tanzania, they are considering it as a drug because it's going on the body, and therefore they are treating it as a drug. And they, they thought it should have gone through National Drug Authority. So these disparities in definitions or policies actually are affecting the, the local traders. traders mm. Number two is about, again, where these uh, ES member countries, they take unilateral decisions. And there is no deterrent law mm. which has been taken at the ESC level to punish a member country maybe which buys mm. unfairly the commodities of these other mm. member states mm. to go into their market. Mm -hmm. uh, which also, of course, brings in the question of uh, the political will of the, political uh, the will member states to absolutely. enforce some of these so provisions. We thought maybe if there is a deterrent law and uh, there is a way you can uh, actually punish a country yes uh, maybe rec you reciprocate and you 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 you, you buy their can uh, their commodities also to come to you to your market mm -hmm. if they have refused your uh, commodities to go in their market then that could be maybe sound uh, the, the warning bells mm -hmm. such that these others when they are maybe taking a, a drastic measure against your goods, mm -hmm. they should be also cautious that maybe similar measure can be taken, can against, be taken against them. Of course, uh, John, uh, I'll come to you. Yes. Uh, you see, 
whatever is there is trying to talk about, I, mm. I think in a way relates to you know the uh, non-tariff barriers. Um, if you look at it broadly, uh, what has been the experience uh, of uh, the small-scale industries uh, you know in Uganda that are trying to do business uh, across uh, not just Kenya but I mean Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi? Mm. Has it been a smooth ride? Well, I was maybe first start from the aspect of awareness. Mm. We conducted a study amongst our members and we found that about 30% were not aware of the whole... They knew the process of integration was going on, but they did not know the specificities specific of, of, of the whole integration process. Then another 20% had, I would say, 30% knowledge, basic knowledge, which, they can, which can only be helpful in assisting them to take advantage of the opportunity. So I would say that the level of ignorance is still high, mm. And the, um, the point is we are not communicating, mm. you know? You have different people trying to communicate this message, but it's not getting to the audiences. Mm. So maybe this is a good platform, in addition to others, that we can use to reach out to our constituencies. Mm. Now, with regard to the experiences of our members who have tried to access the regional markets, the number of issues. There's the issue of ignorance, because every time you don't know the requirements in a particular market, you are afraid to venture out. Therefore, you prefer to stay within that known territory. Mm. The other issue is about the issue of standards that my colleague has alluded to. The issue of harmonization of standards. Because you see, when our members go to the Grand National Bureau of Standards and get the S mark or the Q mark, they would assume that they will not be subject to other to they wouldn't have to go through a similar process in their counterpart country. So mm -hmm. I would say there's need to harmonize these standards, the standards. to ensure that mm -hmm. our manufacturers can take advantage of the markets. But on the whole, as I said earlier, there has been growth in terms of uh, markets for our members as a result of integration. Thank you, John. Um, Sempewa, uh, yes. coming to you. Um, of course, the issue of harmonization is very critical for mm -hmm. processes like these two happen, integration processes. Right. Um, of course, there's been that debate about harmonizing laws, uh, the legal regimes within the East African community, harmonizing regulations, uh, and that kind of thing. And I know you've been quite close to mm. the um, integration process right from the negotiation stages. Mm. Um, are we pushing in the same direction as East Africa in terms of harmonizing the regulations and laws to facilitate business, if you to go into the specifics of that? Um, <coughs> harmonization has been agreed upon already mm. in, in, in Arusha. However, sometimes countries in international trade can frustrate harmonization to seek uh, advantages in trade. Uh, already we have uh, uh, agreed to recognize quality marks. Uh, however, if I remember when we were negotiating the common market protocol, there was a clause, and I, I, I think we shouldn't, have, we shouldn't have included that clause, which allows countries to put in place policies that can counter what you have already agreed uh, uh, together as a block, as long as they notify and justify uh, 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 why they're doing so. Mm. So you may find that although we have already agreed that the quality mark of Uganda should uh, automatically access all these markets, the Rwandese at the border will still subject uh, 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 the commodity test, and they will front reasons like public health, mm. etc., etc. Flip the coin. On the other hand, some businessmen have abused this offer mm -hmm. because at one point another country brought samples of, of commodities that was about three years ago from another country which had that stamp but didn't meet the standards so it's 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 a two-way thing i hear you on one thank hand you very much, john sorry yes. i have to cut you short but yeah um thank you very much viewers for watching us of course we've been looking at doing business in east africa of course, under the East African uh, community or integration uh, arrangement that we're in at the moment. And uh, in the studio, I've been joined uh, by John Sempewa from Uganda Tourism Board, uh, Everest uh, Kayondo from Kampala City Traders Association, and John uh, from Uganda Small Scale Industries Association. Um,
once again, I'd love to thank you so much for being part of the show, part of the discussion. We're trying to really look at um, the dividends that this ESC effort has produced. But then, of course, the challenges there are in. I've been your host, Charles Boji, and over now, I'll hand you over to Wallace in Nairobi. Over to you, Wallace in Nairobi. Over to you, Wallace. Thank you very much, Charles. And, and as Charles was uh, speaking to his guest over in Kampala, there was a lot of nods of agreement in this room, but also some sort of debate that was going on um, when you're getting the feedback. Vimal, I'll begin with you. Some of the things that you're hearing coming out of Uganda, I, I saw lots of nodding on your part. I think uh, the issue of harmonization, like it was clearly said, a lot of harmonization has already happened. It's now just implementation on the ground. And I think the creative non-tariff barriers that are coming up is like a TFDA, Tanzania Food and Drug Authority, that was brought in to say, fine, completely duplicate what the standards are doing, Bureau of Standards. So that's a problem. But I think within Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, we haven't had these sort of problems. Trade is opening up. But at the same time, I think we need to accelerate the whole administration to say whatever was agreed upon, implement it on the ground so that it gets done. Information dissemination. If I have a clear idea I want to trade in East Africa, I should know what the laws are, I should find out. And that's why information must be disseminated. Associations exist there, we can actually pass this on. But overall, I think it's going to start from small traders becoming bigger and saying, I want to go into this country or that country. They first need to go and visit. And by visiting that country, you will know what's the market there, what do people like, and in what language do I talk to them. In Kenya, if you speak to people in English or Swahili, it's okay. In Uganda, if you speak in Swahili, it's a problem. In Tanzania, if you speak in English, it's a problem. So I think understanding the country is going to be important, and therefore, intra-trade will open up. But I would just say, let's accelerate opening up, really free the markets, open movement of goods, movement of services, and also movement of people. Once these three are done, the monetary thing can come in even later. Those are sort of the mechanics of it. I guess you wanted to jump into that conversation as well. I just want to say that uh, one of the reasons why some countries do not comply to the resolutions of the summit is lack of enforcement mm -hmm. and lack of sanctions. And you but doesn't that apply to all of us, all the five countries? Well, the point is, if there's no sanction, there's, there's no punishment for me not complying, yeah. then I can as well buy time and say I don't have the information, and it's not known to me, so you punish the business. But going back to the issue of corruption, I think the biggest challenge for business is the delays, unnecessary delays. Mm -hmm. Then to effectuate some processes, then you are bound to induce some activity. But we are happy that the region is implementing the single, single window mm -hmm. that will bring in some element of automation. Mm -hmm. And this will go a long way in mitigating some of these challenges that the business go through. Someone, I want to jump to you before I come to you, Carol. This, this issues that are being raised both in Uganda in terms of you get your goods to the border and suddenly there's another um, set of uh, standards to fulfill and whatever it is and inspections and all sorts of things. That is just straight avenue to corruption because I'll pay if you can speed things up. Indeed. It's not just corruption. Yeah. It's not just corruption alone, but it's, it's, it's the fact that these countries, they do, I mean, they, 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 it's a way of just deterring trade. Mm -hmm. Because if you, and, and blockage, and, and a lot of times, let's face it, some of the people behind that blockage is other business people in also the country. Also protecting interests. We're just protecting interests, because we, 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 I mean, everybody's protecting their turf, protecting their markets. And if you can use regulations, including no, they need to comply or they need to have another mark, another inspection in Uganda or another inspection in, in Kenya. Kenya. Then that delays entry, frustrates that person, and they'll think twice before they send another consignment. Meanwhile, your goods reign supreme in the market. So there's always a business person behind, behind, all, behind all, these all these barriers. But yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I think the, we've done two studies that uh, are material to this. The first one was the uh, uh, corruption as, as a non-tariff barrier to trade. And, and also the East African Bribery Index, which we do every year. If you look at the reasons why people are paying bribes, it's because they want s faster services. Initially, this used to be a Kenyan problem. I think it is caught on to the East Africa that that is the single most important reason why people would bribe. So if we look at how to 
uh, uh, simply, simply pro, uh, processes, apply technology to make uh, uh, processes less cumbersome, we will have data blow uh, uh, in the fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that is important and has to be em emphasized. But also at, 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 at a much broader level, we need to strengthen and lift the stature of the, the, the structures of the East African community. Mm -hmm. I think we are talking about implementation. The reason why this, uh, we are having that challenge is because our, the various ministries that are charged with this responsibility, their stature is quite low, even at a national level. Mm -hmm. They have problems convincing other ministries within our countries that this is what has been agreed and we need to move ahead. The, the others will tell them that is not our mandate. Our mandate is national. Right, jumping uh, quickly to you, Ashif, uh, and, and this again is familiar from a tax perspective. I'm, I'm emphasizing the tax issue about it because, again, all these things, when it comes to regulations and all this other sort of, I don't call them non-tariff barriers, but effectively that's what they are. Tax is a non-tariff barrier. In, well, it is a tariff barrier, actually, mm -hmm. in the sense that if I'm paying one set of taxes in Kenya and I'm paying another set of taxes in Tanzania and another one in Rwanda, it's equivalent of one of the lorries getting to the border and being told, no, there's a certain stamp on your goods that wasn't present. Mm. Look, we are going to face some difficulty, but what we don't have, and uh, as we will say, is an administrative structure. Mm. If there's a structure at the East African level where you can escalate these issues and quickly a resolution is done on each of the problems faced. We might have one lorry that will have a problem, but it'll make sure that the next, by the time the next lorry hits the border, that issue is resolved. But, but the problem is, and, and let me just fault you for that, I mean, not, not for that, but in the sense that these things tend to happen in a remote location. So they'll happen at Namangal, they'll happen at the border between Rwanda and Burundi, and that person you can call is in a capital city. And so there's still the delay, the lorry is stuck, yeah. the goods are stuck, who do I start calling on a Sunday night? I, I think it's, it's again advertising where to contact. Okay, there, there are you know, good precedents in the world where there's an escalation policy. Everybody knows what number to call. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying, you won't sort out the problem with that one lorry. But if that one lorry, after sorting its problems out, escalates that matter to the next level, the next time it passes through that border, that issue will be resolved. And I think we don't have you know, senior people who can take the decisions and you know, then you know, have a ruling that is straight away implemented. And I think that is where we lack the administrative part of people who can take the decisions for implementation. If you're able to do that, we'll resolve a lot <coughs> of the small problems that we are facing. And not only on taxes, I think on every, there's a labor issue, there is the uh, you know goods issue, uh, and then there is the other issues uh, you know in terms of implementing other policies. And I think all this can be done through having different call centers where you know th with senior people who can take the decisions. Agatha, the the issue that was raised um, in Kampala with regard to Kenyans being very present in the hospitality industry, again, if you have to flip that question to a positive point of view, it seems to imply that we have certain strengths in human resources, so Kenyans may be very good at hospitality, Ugandans may be very good at something else, Tanzanians, Rwandans, Burundians, and uh, all these other places that are there. <clears throat> is that particularly, particularly real, or is it that there could be some resentment? How come you have Kenyans everywhere? How come you have Tanzanians in certain businesses um, everywhere? There is resentment in some places when you look at it from a narrow point of view that you, you've employed many Kenyans. But people are beginning to realize, like Rwanda have done and, and Uganda is now doing, you'll have Kenyans working in the hospitality sector for a while. They're not working there forever. They're transferring skills. Because like now in Rwanda, we have a lot more Rwandese managers. Mm -hmm taking over the properties. They've worked under a Kenyan manager who's been doing it for longer. And Kenya has been in the tourism business for longer, so it is expected that we have skills in that area. But we're transferring skills. And it is then upon the properties that are employing Kenyans to ensure that there's a transfer skill system. But that is working very well. It has worked very well in Rwanda. It's working very well in Uganda. In Uganda now, we have a lot more companies employing Ugandans. And when you now have companies operating regionally, like the Serena Group, in any Serena property, you have people from the three, from at least four East African countries working. So we're, we're sharing skill. It, it's useful. All right, that, that's, that's a useful place to live in. And, and I guarantee there's so much more conversation to have. Everyone is looking at me, wondering where they're the all, time has gone. They're all East Africans, right? 
Who? Kenyans, Ugandans, Tanzanians, they're all East Africans. Fight good, all good time. What they are East Africans stopping to think of ourselves mm -hmm. in our five nationalities and look yeah. at ourselves at the super nationality of East Africa. But the conversation continues. We still have our Twitter platform, our Facebook platform, all these other ways that you can get through to us at East African Voices, East African Voices on Facebook. Let's continue the conversation there. There's a lot more to speak about because the voices of East Africa are the voices of all of us. But for now, thank you very much for being with us and see you soon.